Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining in another podcast, another speaker, another topic. Today, I have I'm your host, Adnan Rafiq, and I'm so excited to bring another MVP on this call. So that being said, with no further ado, I have Eric with me on the call. Yeah, thanks for having me. Adnan. I would like, please tell us something about yourself. Yeah. So, you know, as, as you mentioned, Eric Woodruff, this is my first year as a MVP and just, you know, appreciate being here and, and getting to talk about, uh, you know, my, my sort of career and some, some tech stuff today. I'm, I'm a big identity person, so love going into the weeds about identity and uh, you know, hopefully some, some folks listening in that, that are aspiring to get into cloud security, you know, if they pick identity that that's like the best part. So in my opinion, yeah, I think, I think you already <laughs> shared the top secret, how to get into the cloud or cloud security identity is one of those, right? So Eric, again, congratulations for your first year being an MVP, but uh, tell us, uh, you know, you're working on Azure in cloud. A typical day, I mean, what do you do basically? Yeah. So, I mean, so now I, I work for a company, Semperis, and we make some products that protect Active Directory and Azure AD. So kind of that, that hybrid identity. And so here I actually work in our product group as a product technical specialist. And I guess what, what the, the too long didn't read on what that kind of means is I'm, I'm not like a PM, but I bring a lot of expertise from having worked in the field as a consultant, as an identity architect and sort of the Microsoft ecosystem so that when we're developing stuff around Azure Active Directory and Azure, you know, you kind of have that like real world expertise, right? To sort of feed into, into your products that you're developing. So I guess I, I can be a jack of all trades at times, but a lot of it ends up being either like some sort of security research or, you know, potentially sort of helping us flesh out some things around Azure Active Directory, you know, security. So, yeah. So, yeah. So can you just walk us through a little bit or some scenarios? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think some of our feedback would usually come like in, in how we sort of operate from, you know, interactions with our sales folks and our, our technical like pre-sales engineers. I would say we somewhat glue with, you know, my experience just both, I'd say in the community. So, you know, as an MVP and pre MVP, I mean, I just like talking with folks and, you know, in a, in a way, maybe you'd say it's sort of light advisory type things, right. Where it's just like, you know, I've got this issue or, you know, I've seen this thing, sort of, what do you think stuff, but also previously, so as a, you know, identity or security architect, and also then I was at Microsoft for a while in services. So, you know, I just have a lot of history of working with customers and even over the years and regardless of the industry vertical or whether they're large or small, I mean, there, there's just patterns that you see when you work with enough people. So it's, it's kind of just bringing a lot of that knowledge in together with what, you know, our customers are looking for to kind of drive, you know, like what, what is critical as far as product development goes. Right. And I mean, you always have like a list of things that people want and you sort of have to sort that in, in priority. And you just, I, I think as right, more and more organizations consume Azure Active Directory and Office or M365 and Azure and all that, right. The, the security of identity is, is kind of, you know, at the, the center of it all. Let's talk about like somewhere for identity security, like, you know, what things do you see in the field, in the market, like in terms of threats, in terms of issues, and what are the solutions for that? Yeah. I mean, it, it's a, it, it can be a, it's a, a broad question, but I'd say sort of sometimes I ramble. So to try to keep it concise, like, I mean, I've, I've worked with customers who had Office 365, who didn't even know that they had Azure Active Directory under the covers. And so you'd run a workshop, basically helping them understand sort of the, the, the basics of things. A lot of times you'll see organizations that won't deploy almost anything. Like they, they sort of get that, that shock where they're like, we have so many things to do because we bought E5 or something and they're like overwhelmed by it. And they're like, well, we're just, we're, we're almost like not going to do anything because we don't even know where to start. So, you know, in those cases you may go in and be like, well, right. These are sort of the, the critical things you need to do. And I mean, when it comes to identity security, ultimately the, the most critical is securing global admin and, and kind of those, those adjacent accounts. And if they have active directory, there's also, you know, certain things you want to do to make sure that if like active directory is breached, that they also can't, a threat actor can't easily move into Azure AD or sort of vice versa if Azure AD was breached, but you, you would see even patterns like a lot of, I mean, probably the, the top 
common things you'd see are either way too many global admins. You see daily driver, like, you know, my very regular user account, that's also a global admin. And on those highly privileged accounts, the, the lack of, of MFA, you know, mm -hmm. being deployed on them. I just personally, I'll just say, I predict that, right? We, we see in a lot of ransomware attacks and, you know, all these cyber attacks that a lot of times Active Directory is kind of used to move throughout. And right, if you think of domain admin as, as that keys to the kingdom, I mean, global admin is like that, but on, on steroids, depending on how you integrate everything into Azure AD. And, and I, I predict that we'll see threat actors trying to move that direction because you, you really could operate with a lot of speed and taking over organizations, you know, in the cloud. So. And I think it gets even more complicated when it comes to hybrid. Yeah, no, and I mean, the hybrid part is interesting. I mean, I'd say for a few different reasons, but you know, we'll also see that organizations will you know, throw systems out in Azure, or it can even be AWS or GCP. It doesn't really matter, but they're, they're putting VMs out there that are domain controllers and they're not really following any sort of well-architected framework, which again, in itself, right, you go read docs on that and it can feel overwhelming. But in these ways that, right, I, I could have VM contributor on a domain controller and maybe we don't consider my account highly privileged and we're not realizing that if I'm breached, I can run some commands on the management plane right through the Azure portal or Azure CLI and basically infiltrate that domain controller. And now I have domain admin and, you know, now I'm going into all your sort of legacy, you know, server infrastructure. And, and I, I'll just say also, I think the hybrid part is complicated because, I mean, I, I have a long, I have, you know, 20 years of sort of active directory management experience that. There, there's a set of Active Directory folks that, for one reason or another, seem to, you know, whether it's lack of time or, you know, the sort of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, don't really sort of learn Azure AD, and they just kind of say somewhat, I don't want to sound negative, but like ignore it. But it's really just putting the organization at risk if, if you're not understanding the technology you own. That absolutely makes sense. So do you want to talk about what are the controls available? So is there something... You specifically talk about, hey, you know, these are the tools and capabilities one should look at. Yeah. I mean, I, I like a lot of times if an organization doesn't know where to start to actually use, there's a Microsoft doc article that's like a rapid modernization. It's it's like the, it's ramp. And I, I can't remember the exact article, but usually if you Google like Microsoft ramp, the first hit is is for this. And, and it, it kind of, I, I like it because it's easy to sort of talk through with customers and, you know, it's like really focused on those privileged accounts. And it's like, you know, we want to make sure you at least have MFA. If you have conditional access, right, be using that again, at least for privileged accounts. And then ultimately it kind of goes through all these things for privilege, like using PIM if you have it. And and honestly, I guess I'd also say with privileged accounts many times, it it's easy in a sense because, right, you don't need to go through change control if you're only impacting your your administrators or hopefully not right it's it's like if i'm making my life change because i'm saying well now i have to use pim it's different than saying you know the organization has to do this thing so so a lot of those honestly are are quick wins usually when you get into the the area of like using a privileged access workstation is where it can become more complex but th that honestly is still something that's also critical that you'll see a lot of orgs for those global admin like the tier 0 type accounts not not using. And then then I guess I'd say on the enterprise side, I, at the very least, wanting to make sure that you're using MFA for your employees, you know, sort of across the board these days. And and I think there are some of it is shifting our mindset around what we're trying to protect. I, I had a customer I was working with who they had a case of business email compromise. I mean, just for folks that maybe haven't heard of business email compromise before, right? That, that's where you know, I infiltrate someone's email and then I start sending mail out as them. And, and in this instance, someone got into their CFO's inbox and sent an email as a CFO to one of the CFO's employees asking to transfer like half a million dollars out of some bank account. The person went and did it, right? And th that's not how we maybe traditionally thought of a critical account, but obviously, right, their CFO hack there, they lost half a million bucks, right? It's, 
a business impact still. How can they be protected? Let's say, you know, what, like you mentioned MFA, right? And so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I would say it's, it's just the, starting with MFA, conditional access, if you have it using security defaults, if you don't, but you know, I would also, I'm a big proponent of passwordless. So like, hello for business, you know, using the authenticator app for passwordless on mobile devices, there, there's still some gaps around the difference between passwordless and phishing resistant because the authenticator app is is still something that you could technically fish but from the the brokered SSO perspective where you're you're trying to not have your users constantly being asked to reauthenticate because many times we'll also see that if you create too much friction for your users they'll they'll find ways around things right they'll send sensitive documents to their personal email or they'll save things to personal sort of things or whatnot like like our end users, right? If we if we're if we make their life too difficult for them, they they will find a way around security. Yeah. So and also one thing is important: education is very necessary, or trainings are very necessary because you made a good point. People will find a way out because I've seen people in finance and accounting if the authenticator app prompt them if they're logged in. So if the education and training is not done right, when to click approve or deny, yeah, they will just approve it, and yeah. You never know, the actor is invoking that on there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, you'd see that. I mean, luckily now with number matching rolling out. Yes. I mean, in a way, right, it, it's a it's a technical implementation to try to interfere with a sort of human problem. But yeah, at the same time, right, I mean, I'll, some people like to say that security is everyone's job at the same time, right? Those people hired in finance or sales or whatever, right? Like they're not here to be a security person. They're here to get whatever their job is done. So in some of these things, I like, I don't, I don't fault them necessarily for if they're just getting bombed with push notifications to be like, oh, right. Like the system's broken. I'm just going to hit accept. But yeah, I think training is critical both for our end users, but also I think for, you know, our technology professionals, and even in, in particular people in security, right? Like some folks with a long security history sometimes almost had this joy of right, making your user's life miserable when right, th these days you've, you've got to work with your users to, to sort of understand what their experience is like and understand that, right? Like, sure, we do phishing training yearly or something, but if someone also right, clicks on a phished email, like how much can you really fault them for that when it's not their, their primary job? But yeah, no, I do agree with that. You can expect this thing from somebody who is with the IT, but outside the IT domain, finance and accounting and HR. Yeah, exactly. And the technology has to be more simpler in yeah. my opinion, you know, and again, we have so many options for MFA, like text-based voice call, MFA on the authenticator app, now number matching. I started seeing for the last few days, but again, if I have to go and show it to my mom or somebody, you know, for them, you know, so tech yeah. security and technology has to be that much easy. You can explain to a kid or somebody who's elderly people. Yeah. So. I, I, you know, I totally agree with that. You know, you can expect those things from someone who is in IT, but an IT has got to be more simpler. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. So now change the gear a little bit. So I get question around people, hey, we want to transition and they want to become a cloud engineer security. So if somebody wants to become a Azure engineer, cloud engineer, security engineer, you know, what should they learn first or what should be the career path or something you want to advise? Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, so in, in a couple different threads there, I guess I'll, I'll tackle if, if you just like, you know, say you're, you're new to IT or you're looking to transition in IT and you don't have that background, you know, I, I'd say at least in the Microsoft ecosystem, right, taking those foundational courses, you know, honestly, I find a lot of the content these days on Microsoft Learn to be quite good. And a lot of times Microsoft will run, you know, different things through the year, right? Where they'll offer like a voucher for free, you know, certification and like AZ 900 or, you know, MS 900. And then I would just try to take advantage of as many, you know, free resources as there are out there. Right. I mean, I'm not big into like, you know, vlogging and stuff like that, but there's some folks out there who just pump out quality content all the time. That's, that's going to be as good as right. Having 
some consultant come in or something and and educate you on stuff. Right. But it, it also, I, I, it can be a lot to get into. You know, I think some of those roles that really like, like help desk, you know, potentially can, can really help inform you as to what the user experience is. And, and I think in ways that can also help you, right, sort of build this empathy for our end users, which is a good sort of on-ramp right into the cloud to, to, you know, like if you've been, say, working as a system man with Active Directory for a long time, you know, I don't, I don't want to say just em embrace it. And I know that that's kind of like a vague answer, but once you get past some certain hurdles of learning, right, there are similarities between Azure AD and Active Directory. You still have users and groups and devices and attributes on all these things. And in ways it can feel familiar, you know, I think it, it, it's trying to look at what modern authentication with SAML and OpenID Connect is like compared to, uh, you know, Kerberos or LDAP. But, you know, I, I think it, it's not being afraid, right? Like, the cloud isn't going to take our job. I mean, I remember maybe a decade ago when everyone's like, oh, right, cloud's come in and we're all going to lose our jobs. And now we need more cloud jobs than, than ever. Because if anything, it's more complex in ways than yeah. what we had on-prem. So, yeah, yeah I, I'd say just that that learning piece. And, and I mean, there are resources. So one, one thing I'll just put out there is the M365 developer program. Because from an identity perspective, that will get you an Azure Active Directory tenant for free with 25 M365 E5 licenses. And as long as you're active in that thing, right, it, it's all on that M365 license side of the house. But I mean, you'll be able to get exposure that you'd get in an enterprise, right? Build, build up that lab. If you're not home, I have box running ESX and the domain controller and Azure AD Connect and all that sort of stuff. So I can you know, actually see what things are going to be like, you know, before you, you go play around in production. So what you just mentioned, take advantage of free subscription M365, play around with that and develop your hands-on skills yeah. because these are important. You know, the employer eventually is going to hire you because you should be able to deliver something. And the best way is to learn to make use of those free subscription, whether it's Azure 365, whichever. So what's your take on certifications. Oh, that that's a funny one. So I used to be, I'd say when I was a system in sysadmin, systems engineer, I was maybe a bit more pessimistic about certifications, but I, I think they've changed over the years. Like again, if you go back like MCSE, MCSA, I mean, way back when, when I studied for A plus, it all felt like you need to remember all these super esoteric things. Certifications these days feel more like, like let's test your sort of applicable knowledge that's actually relevant to things and not, can you remember like this very esoteric piece of things? I mean, I think if you're looking to get into the industry, they definitely can help, right? Because they can help set you apart from the crowd, whether you're you're new or even if you're looking to transition, right? And you've been in the industry for a while. I think certifications, one, they will give you a standardized sort of path for learning, right? To help you sort of skill up to see where maybe you have gaps in your knowledge. Then yeah, it's also that, that you know, just sort of standing out from the crowd piece of things. So when I mean, I, I have a bunch of certifications, you know, now, it's, you know, there's people that, that sort of certainly will collect them. And um, I think it's important to still know the stuff that you're getting certified in, right? They, if I go get some you know, Azure data protection cert and I just study for it and then I forget it all, right? Like, I probably don't want to put myself in a position to be like, oh, I, I know about, you know. Right. Data protection. No, yeah, makes sense. So basically certification would only have most relevant to your day-to-day -day job or the role you are in, right? So this is where, uh, but there are some beginner level certification you were saying for somebody to get started, but you know, if you are data protection certified, but if you're not practicing it, it's not going to help. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, right. If, if it's where you want to go, that's a different story, right? There, there's nothing wrong with, you know, taking certs or even some of the base level certs right in that. I mean, I see a lot of stuff now, right, with AI coming out all over the place with chat GPT and all that, where, right, there's a lot of interest in understanding it more. So, you know, you want to go take AI certification, I, I think, but there, there's certainly places where, even if it's not relevant to what you're doing now, it, it might still be helpful for your year and your career right. down the road, so... Yeah, so, yeah, exactly, because this is the new area and, you know, you cannot find somebody with five years experience, so that's totally a different thing. <laughs> but if, 
but that's for sure if you are in the infrastructure, then there are people for so many years and this is there. And I think for people who wanted to start, they should look for those areas where there's the less competition, basically on the new technologies and all that. So that's why I always recommend yeah. people to explore on those areas. So the lab, so what else, let's say if you were like some quantities when you wanted to hire someone, right? So somebody has a good resume, experience, okay, they get there. So are there any, anything else do you look for or you think candidates should have? I mean, I, I suppose it's become a bit of a, I don't know if I'd say cliche thing, but the, the soft skills. I mean, not that having soft skills are cliche, but like people just kind of bucket right? Interpersonal skills into those. But just, I'd say, especially in that if you are going in any route where you have to interact with people, like as a consultant, as an engineer, you know, starting off in help desk or knock or something. But you know, it used to be people would want to show off what they know and it'd be like all these know-it-alls and, and whatnot. And you're, you're kind of always trying to one-up everyone else where I actually really liked when I was at Microsoft that one of the things that was sort of preached is to be a learn-it-all, right? Like, it's okay to not know everything. It's more like having that, that passion to go learn. But I also think that that really sort of helped dampen down the people who are like, right, I need to be like the smartest person in the room because but it, it, it can be off-putting. You, you can't be condescending to end users, especially if you want, you know, back to what we're talking about, to, to get them to, right, help you on your security journey. You, you've got to work with them. So you need to, you need to understand how to sort of think like them, how to understand what they do for work. And, and you know, I think a lot of that becomes that interpersonal communication skills. It, it makes sense. And also depends what your role is, right? But you're always supposed to have good interpersonal soft skill communication skills. But in the beginning, we were talking about what your role is. If your role is more pre-sales kind of thing, a customer facing, then it will, yeah. you, it, it may become not mandatory, but very close to mandatory. You got to have to the skills and listening is very important because when you're in the customer calls, you have to understand versus if you're somebody who is just working on those and this is where the hardest skills make more sense. You have to deal with the configuration and all that. So yeah. there's, it's something you cannot ignore it, but again, based on the job role you have, yeah, that, that may change. In your product development, that you transition from to director, you've been managing those and transitions so or something. You want to share what has changed, like you were managing those and is just organically happen to this role or something you plan. And if you did, what did you have to do, learn differently? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, so I, I actually spent the first 50, well, I actually started in IT as a Unix engineer during the whole dot-com boom in the late nineties. But then I spent a good portion of my career actually working for the state of New York for the court system in, in the state. And for about 10 of those years, I managed the team that managed all the Windows estate. And that included Active Directory and everything. And, and eventually we went to Office 365 and started dabbling in Azure. And so I, I kind of helped lead that charge there. And right, I've, I've always been to some degree a Microsoft fanboy. In 2019, I was reached out to by Microsoft to offer a, a job as a premier field engineer there, which at the time was in services. They've kind of changed some of that stuff up now. But, you know, I, I at one point was sort of set, like, I'll, I'll just work here and retire. And, and maybe it was on cruise control somewhat. But th I would say this, the, the job offer for Microsoft sort of like was career 2.0 for me, really reinvigorated me. It really taught me a lot about community. But yeah, when I went to Microsoft, they were basically like, you can focus on whatever you want, but it has to be cloud. I kind of always had this passion for identity. So I just really delved into Azure AD there. And you just, that kind of kept carrying forward. I really though enjoyed delivering workshops when I was there. So it was a lot of different customers. I got into developing workshops on conditional access on Windows Hello for Business and you contributing to the, and left there to try my hand at a couple partners. And I, I, I personally just kind of got burnt out from consulting just from that whole work-life balance bit. But that, that's the, sort of how I transitioned from like, you know, active directory to, to the, the whole Azure AD bit. So yeah, I get it. Yeah. Consulting is the final real. <laughs> yeah. So for those, yeah, it, it can be good fit if you're new in the career. So it could be a good way to start into the consulting. You'll be on the road Monday through Thursday, flying, traveling, whichever the case <laughs> is, right? So again, I mean, there are opportunities for they, they want to break into those. So you cannot yeah. go wrong with it. But at, yeah. 
some point in your career, you get to the point, right? Well, I mean, for me, I, I you know, I, I see folks around me who, you know, I, I see like incident response, right? Consultants and architects. And right, I think it's all just partially your personality too. I mean, you see these people, they they thrive on that stuff in that, you know, when those things happen, not that it's good that it happened, but when they go into those things, like you see, like the rush they sort of get of, right? Like evicting the threat actor and, you know, trying to bring everything back together. And right, it, it almost seems like it's something you'd, you'd see in the movies or, or whatnot, right? I think I think for me and my personality, it's more just like kind of being a little more more low key. So, but. yeah, no, absolutely makes sense because this is a huge industry. There is room for everyone for different type yeah. of roles. It's not you could have a title of cloud engineer, but you will be doing different uh, roles and responsibilities. So there's a lot of confusion. You know, there's a lot of not the right way of guidance available, especially when I get the feedback on the social media. I tell the people just start spinning up the labs and learn it, hands-on experience, take a job you need, and then you will develop your own journey. You learn it, but yeah. always see and learn from the industry, or at least listen and watch because the people who contribute to the community, they are sharing insight. You will not find in any of those boot camps and any of those training. And go yeah. check out like Microsoft Community Event or even Google and AWS, whichever, because those yeah. are the things that tell you the insights. Yeah. And again, you mentioned like incident response and all that. So, you know, that's somebody who's new or they want to learn fast because I've seen in those areas, you pretty much learn pretty quick in within a six month or a year because you will burn out if you are in those incident response call. I mean, you know, so level three or two engineer, I mean, uh, those can be, but very hectic, but at the same time, there's a lot of learning. So you, you go and learn and decide as you go on. So, so summarize this in identity. We talked about companies to make sure do not have unnecessary global admin or root admin, like accounts in any of those environment, like Microsoft or non-Microsoft. So make sure you reduce your global admin, make sure you leverage privilege access management, make sure you leverage multi-factor authentication. And the thing what I'm telling people. If you want to build your career, you got to learn those skills. So this yeah. is the business ex advice, but at the same time, you literally can develop your skills by learning how to set it up. So this is where will be one of your role. Yeah, then, yeah, and you could even architect on that based on the experience you get. get no, I, I'll say that. I think actually you hit on a good point though, when you were mentioning AWS and GCP and, and kind of back to learning, like the, the best, one of the other best ways I think you'll you'll succeed is to just embrace that, learn it all. And if you work in Azure, you know, you'll probably find at some point you're going to need to learn AWS or GCP. And, and it, it's not like you're going to put our, your foot down and be like, no, I'm only going to do Azure. I mean, I, I have a lot of Azure AD experience. Then eventually I ran into some customer who was like, well, we're integrating AWS with Azure Active Directory. And I'm like, well, I, I guess yeah. now I need to go learn AWS it, to, to Right in these ways, and if I was like, well, I don't care about AWS, it wouldn't, right. it wouldn't have helped. But no, I just wanted to say, no, I think in particular with identity and, and learning all these things, you know, a lot of cybersecurity and information security, however you want to put it, jobs that kind of get out there. Identity is a bit slept on. I mean, we need a ton of identity people. If you like making a lot of money, it can, it can pay quite well. It, it may not seem as like glamorous as some other cybersecurity roles, but yeah. no, it's, it's, it's something that we need a, a lot of identity people out yeah. here. So yeah, I, I keep telling people the threat landscape has changed. You're not behind the firewalls anymore. Identity yeah. is your first line of defense when it comes to the cloud. Yeah. So again, I see a lot of forum people are learning traditional skills. There's nothing wrong with that, but why don't you start learning identity from the get go? Because first competition is obviously less. You'll find network engineer with 20 years experience in identity. You won't, you may have 10 years, more or less. We can argue on that Azure, it's been here yeah. and AWS, but definitely not somebody who's a system administrator with 30 years experience in, in cloud. No way you can. So why not build the skills? Yeah. So win yeah. the whole ecosystem of identity, there's a lot of growth. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's a, a, just another great point in that. Well, obviously you need to focus on understanding the technology, right? There's like just in time access, for example, through something, through something like PIM, you're going to find that in AWS or Google or but, right, like CyberArk or something. So I guess my point is right that becoming like an identity practitioner where you also understand the right sort of the, the theory, I guess I'd say behind 
the security of identity and then then you can kind of move around and you're not just tied to like why well, I, I can only manage identity in azure or something like that so to do those who just heard what eric just have explained and give you the secrets is that azure identity aws octa cyber guys literally develop your career and make lucrative good money so start learning those tools and every enterprise has these tools so jobs are there. So there is cloud security, cloud engineering brings a lot, a lot of new requirements. So you cannot go wrong with that. So that has been said, Eric, I really appreciate it. Those are very yeah. insightful thing. And I think identity is one of those pieces. It's just been growing and I hope to hear, hope to see you sometime soon, but really appreciate it, man. This was really good. And, no, I appreciate uh, um, that. and again, congratulations, congratulations, MVP, and hope you keep continuing to doing that. Yeah. And I'll see you sometime soon in the next episode. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, Sadan. And then I'll just, if I can pitch my blog, ericonidentity.com, you can sort of keep up with me there. I know, I know all the identity things. Yeah. So. so, yeah, those who are, so I will post your blog link cool. right in the description of this video. Awesome. So people, if they want to reach out to you and read more about you and your blog. Yeah. So that's being cool. said, thank you. I'll see you again. Yeah, thanks for having me.